Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop hearing system or if any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able to and just ask one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Deputy Director of the Department of Military History, Dr. Gerges. Well, thank you all for coming out today. Um, it's really my honor to, to uh, uh, introduce a, uh, a really distinguished colleague uh, and friend from our Department of Military History. Uh, you saw a little bit on his bio. John is, uh, came to Command General Staff College in 20, uh, 2000, retired in 2004 from the Navy uh, as a commander. He's a Naval Flight Officer on land and uh, carrier-based aviation. Uh, the bio that you have on the little sheet there is a little old. That only listed his five books up to 2017. Uh, he's now up to seven books. His newest book, uh, uh, Strategy in Crisis, just came out this year. Uh, and as I was talking to him a few minutes ago, his eighth book uh, is sitting over KU Press waiting for its manuscript review. So John is very, very prolific. Um, he's also very distinguished. He has been uh, the William Stoff, Major General William Stoff Chair of History for the Commander General Staff College. Um, uh, it's a three-year um, honorary chair uh, that John was. And he was also the uh, Fleet Admiral Ernest J. King Visiting Professor of Maritime History at the Naval War College in 2021. Um, and so I'd like to, at this point, turn it over to John. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, you know, one way to uh, cut down on the questions is, tr is to try to pick some really esoteric topic, you know, that nobody knows anything about. Unfortunately for me, I've got a couple guys in the back row there that know probably more about this than I do. Um, so today we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at a really interesting uh, uh, campaign. Actually, it's a series of campaigns uh, in Northeast Asia. And the major players are going to be Korea, uh, United Korea, uh, the Ming Dynasty of uh, China, so the Empire of China under the Ming, and uh, the Japanese, who had just uh, gone through this period of, of war and uh, were under the leadership of the second great unifying uh, shogun, uh, who's, uh, who's, who we're going to talk about, Hideyoshi Toyotomi. Uh, so let's get down to it. All right. Uh, I want to point out a couple things you'll, you should, should see there. So at the time that the invasion took place, this was your standard Japanese samurai. Now, samurai means service or to serve. Note the arrows here. Uh, he, he, probably, he probably deflected those arrows with his sword. The sword actually wasn't his primary weapon. His primary weapon was probably a, a composite bow of some sort. So the samurai, the mounted samurai, their main weapon was was the bow. It was not the sword. The sword was sort of to do the coup de grace, although I guess it looks like it's pretty good for countermeasures against other arrows. And then down here in the corner, this is at the Command and General Staff College, a gift from one of our Korean students one year. This is a turtle boat. We'll talk about the turtle boats. Really interesting maritime technology that the uh, Koreans will use uh, to, uh, in, this, in this conflict. Okay. Well, let's, we have to go back a little bit. Uh, uh, Japan had initially uh, gotten involved in, in Korea in, uh, in what we would regard as the early Middle Ages uh, or the late Roman Empire, and they had been ejected from Korea. So they had tried to kind of set up shop in Korea uh, uh, as they were expanding uh, from Honshu, uh, and they had actually been ejected from Korea. And then for almost a 1,000 years, the Japanese stayed away from the Asian mainland, all right? Uh, but in the 13th century, the Mongols, uh, under, uh, under, the, uh, under, the, under the Yuan emperor, 
uh, launched a series of invasions. And, and these kind of had, had an impact on Japan. Japan never forgot about the fact that the Mongols, uh, with their Chinese and their Korean allies, had launched these invasions across the relatively narrow strait, Korea Strait, Strait of Tsushima, as we sometimes call it. Uh, and these invasions had been repelled, but, uh, but uh, at great cost, and they had caused sort of this dynamic in the Japanese psyche of uh, having to worry about uh, the threat from Northeast Asia. So the late Sengoku, the Sengoku means the warring period or the warring states period. There weren't really any states. There were really warring warlords, all right? And just, so Japan was, was from, the, from the bottom of Japan to the top of Japan for about 150 years prior to our year of 1600. Uh, the Japanese had been at war. Uh, it was a civil war. Uh, and it raged from one end of Japan to the other. It kind of flared up. It flared down. Um, and it was during this period that a key warlord named Oda, Oda Nobunaga, or sometimes no, Nobunaga, rose to power and began to unify uh, Japan. He was not the shogun. The shoguns had become these ineffectual, uh, had become these ineffectual leaders that lived outside Kyoto, and they were they were they were figureheads. They were even more figureheads than the emperors were, and the emperors were were like in the closet. So so in this period, the people that ran Japan were these warlords. They were called daimyo, daimyo, the great warlords. And Oda, no Oda Nobunaga wasn't a great daimyo. He was from sort of the lower order of the. Of the, of the samurai nobility, but he was not a great warlord. Um, he had, uh, we're going to meet these two characters who were, who became his primary lieutenants. Initially, uh, uh, t uh, Hideyoshi, the guy that's going to invade Korea, was actually, wasn't even a samurai. He actually kind of comes up from the bottom. He's a kind of a self-made man, and we'll kind of talk about that, uh, that uh, process by which he sort of becomes uh, uh, the de facto ruler of Japan and uh, the shogun who replaces Oda Nobunaga when Oda Nobunaga dies. Um, also, another one of uh, Nobunaga's lieutenants is actually one of his, his adversaries, uh, uh, Iyasu Tokugawa. And Tokugawa famously establishes the Tokugawa shogunate, which lasts for several hundred years and is still in place when Matthew C. Perry and the black ships come over to the Kanto Plain, and, and we force a commercial treaty on the Jap Japanese in, uh, in the late 1850s. So these are three very important guys, and they sort of succeed each other. You know, Nobunaga comes into power before Japan is completely unified, then Japan will become completely unified under Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi will, will leave the scene, and then uh, 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 Tokugawa will take over and put down several rebellions to finally cement the power of the shogun. These are just some uh, pictures to kind of give you a feel for sort of the kind of uh, uh, kit that these guys had. We'll get a little bit more into the, the weapons and everything. This is a, a helmet. Uh, oftentimes, the helmets will be kind of the most flashy thing these guys wear. Most, most of the rest of their outfits, unless they're, unless they're really wealthy samurai or daimyo, are going to be pretty utilitarian. Again, notice the arrows, defending against the arrows. This is from, also from CGSC, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our professors. Uh, let me take a picture of that. And then here again, this is your samurai with the composite bow, uh, ready to defend. Notice this helmet is almost exactly like that helmet. All right, so we have to understand this idea of gekko kujo. Gekko kujo. Um, gekko kujo means those from below replacing or opposing or, or having their way with those above, all right? It, it's an uh, idiomatic term, and it, 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 today it, it, we, it gets translated often as field initiative or alftrage tactic or mission command, this idea that there's, the subordinates have absolute authority to conduct initiative. And during the Warring States period, when, to, when Hideyoshi is rising to power, this is how the samurai rise and get this social mobility that for, for centuries had been very, very, very static. There had been, it had been very, very difficult unless you were really high up in the samurai hierarchy to kind of rise. But what happens is you have all these sort of lower level people that start to revolt and start to kind of overthrow the power structure. And that's called Gekko Kujo. Uh, uh, 
Is it loyal initiative? Or, uh, loyal to who? And this will take us all the way into World War II, Gekko Kujo, because it'll be loyal initiative to the emperor that'll cause these Japanese lower ranking officers who will sort of drag Japan into wars. And that's the same thing that occurs. So for 150 years, you know, people are switching sides, stabbing each other in the back, assassinating their, their lords as they establish themselves, uh, and kind of turning on each other. Betrayal was common. Switching sides was common. This idea of traitors doesn't really apply in this culture. You're not a traitor if you're doing it in your interests. Um, but we call this today mission command, where you let, you know, you sort of push authority down to the subordinates to the lower levels. Well, the origins of this war, Japan is unified. So Nobunaga uh, uh, is assassinated, and his faithful lieutenant Hideyoshi engineers things to replace him. Initially, Hideyoshi is not the chosen successor, but he kind of plays a very skillful political game. And he becomes, he becomes the de facto, the de facto shogun, all right? He's not the real shogun. He can't be a real shogun because he doesn't have noble blood. So he sort of becomes the principal advisor to the shogun, even though the shogun is like a 10-year-old kid, which is common in Japan, all right? To have 10-year-old emperors and 10-year-old shoguns like that. So he sort of becomes the regent. That's how we would look at it, as a regent. And he unifies Japan. He, uh, like I say, he, his, principal, uh, his principal lieutenant is Yasu Tokugawa. And he and Tokugawa kind of finish unifying Japan all the way from the southern island of Kyushu to the far north. The armies they have are huge. And I'll talk about that in a second. These are 100,000-man armies that are kind of bopping around Japan at, at one one uh, at Odawara, the siege of Odawara, the, the besieged garrison is around 98,000 uh, retainers inside the fortress walls of Odorawa. And Hideyoshi's army is somewhere in the region of 100 to 150,000 troops, depending on who you count and who you don't count. And he just kind of sits outside and feasts and, and just waits until Odorawa starves to death and they come to him. So, so these are really big armies so, that he's got here. So when peace comes to Japan, you've got a fully armed nation that has these huge armies, and now they don't have anything to do. At the same time, Hideyoshi is a megalomaniac, all right? Hideyoshi has visions of himself as the reincarnation of Genghis Khan, all right? And he actually uses Japanese characters to say, hey, if you take these and you put these into, uh, alliterate these into Chinese, they, they mean, you know, I'm, I'm a descendant of Genghis Khan. It's kind of that sort of thing going on. But he sends a mission over to the Ming Dynasty, which is the regional hegemon of Asia in this period uh, that dominates Asia from the Philippines all the way up to Korea. And the Ming uh, rebuff his trade outreach. He wants to get a, a, the right to trade silk and goods inside China, as well as to bring Chinese goods into Japan and start to rebuild Japan. Now, did this really happen, or is this just an excuse, you know, to, to, get, to get angry and invade Korea, all right? So uh, I mentioned the Mongol invasions. They had been based and launched from Korea with the help of Korean mariners uh, and Chinese mariners. And so, so the Japanese sort of blame the Koreans and the Chinese for these invasions. Um, and of course, there, there's the mythos of the kamikaze, the divine wind, that defeats the, uh, the, the, the main Mongol fleet in the second invasion. But an awful lot of hard fighting took place as well by the samurai. Okay, so there's this fear that, hey, they might do it again, you know. Um, so there's no disarmament that takes place after Japan is unified. 300,000 veteran troops, that's sort of my round figure for what uh, Hideyoshi has. Many of these troops are Christian. The Dutch and the Portuguese have converted many of these troops, all right? Uh, the bulk of the Christians are from the island of Kyushu, and we'll talk about one of the Christian warlords here. So this is a really interesting culture and place. And, you know, Hideyoshi, uh, he takes offense, so he decides to invade Korea. Korea is just a, an avenue of approach to go against the Ming, 
to go against the Ming. Now, too bad for Hideyoshi, if he'd, if he'd waited for 40 years, the Ming would have been in collapse and he could have taken China easily, right? But uh, he doesn't wait. He has no idea that the Ming are going to start to collapse within two, two generations. Uh, and he sees himself as basically uh, conquering the world. He's got this army that's never been defeated. He's a general who's never lost a battle, or let, at least that's the narrative that he presents. And so he's going to take these veteran troops and he's going to conquer the world with them. You know, um, so it's really two wars. There's going to be an invasion in 1592, and then there's going to be a ceasefire. Uh, most of that, the important conflict, a conventional conflict, is going to take place north of the Imjin River. Uh, and then there's going to be a second invasion, 1597 to 1598. That will be mostly south of the Imjin and the Han Rivers, okay? And uh, we'll look, look at some geography of Korea here in a second. The Articles of War. So uh, at, at the Command and General Staff College, um, we teach our students about uh, something called the military revolution, all right? And there's a lot of argument back and forth between military historians about what is the military revolution? Is there such a thing as a military? Is there one military revolution? Well, I'm here to tell you there is a social, political, military revolution in Asia. It has to do with the, the production of gunfire, cannon, uh, gunpowder, cannon that, that are diffusing technology out of uh, China, as well as some technology that's being brought into Asia from from the West, but the bulk of the technology is actually local. And what happens is, is that infantry becomes the main article of warfare in, in Asia. And, and these Asian, the Asian pattern looks a lot like the European pattern. Uh -huh. They have cannon, they have arc buses, uh, which are, which are, are like, like uh, matchlock muskets, um, and they have, uh, they have pikemen. So they have these combined arms formations that if you put them on the battlefield of Europe and put them in sort of the European garb, they're going to look a lot like what's going on in Europe. In some sense, they're ahead of the Europeans. There are some things that, that the Asian armies are doing in China and Korea and Japan that we don't see the Europeans doing. Uh, one thing that they're really doing is they, they have mass. They, they have an incredible amount of mass. Their armies on on, on, uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a comparative basis are bigger than the European armies, all right? So they've figured out the logistics here. Now, most of the logistics are being conducted by the water, so they use junks and ships to kind of supply these huge armies. Japan is an archipelago of islands, and so the way you get these guys supplied is with ships. So a lot of the logistics is actually waterborne, which is why they can have these large armies. So what we're going to from Japan is from this, the horse-mounted archer, who's sort of like the, uh, the universal soldier, you know, this, this lethal combat machine, uh, to mostly this, arquebusiers that look almost exactly like their European counterparts, pikemen doing the same sorts of pike tactics and formations that we're seeing the Swiss do in Europe. Now remember, this is in the, this is in the 1500s that, that, that these, these articles are being adopted, okay? And then we're seeing ships like this that exist out there, gigantic uh, uh, galleys and ships like this, which could go to the Mediterranean and keep pace with the Ottomans if you wanted them to. And then these, and these are Ming cannon, uh, 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 a little lighter, uh, more mobile. Uh, and these are some of the Chinese, uh, Chinese and Korean soldiers. Again, not much different. They still have swordsmen. They still have uh, 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 archers that they use. They, have, uh, they also have uh, crossbowmen. They have, uh, they have giant crossbows that they use, too. They have these giant sort of... So they, it's a really interesting mix of weapons of warfare that these different Asian cultures bring to bear against each other. But again, what I'm trying to tell you is it's not much different than what's taking place in the rest of the world. And this, that, this, this military revolution is happening globally. It's not just happening in Europe. In other words, Europe isn't special. And here you go with a, uh, this could easily be uh, a mounted heavy cavalryman in any of the armies uh, of the Middle East or, or the Ottomans or the Europeans. Uh, and, and that could be a halberd. Uh, again, it's refined 
double-edged steel. So if these guys go across the Pacific and get to the Americas before the Europeans do, they're going to have probably just as much success as Cortez and uh, Pizarro are going to have because they have training and they have fine, fine steel that's highly edged with discipline and training. This is the Japanese army embarking for the invasion of Korea. Just let it sink in. Just kind of soak in the scale here. Massive. The main commanders are going to be Kato Kiyomasa, So Yoshitune, and Konishi Yukanagi. Uh, Yukanaga is the Christian warlord. And he's most famous because he has this wild, like, two-foot-tall helmet that he wears around. And it's really cool looking. I tried to find a picture of it, but I couldn't. Uh, about 150,000 troops in the initial invasion force. In the initial invasion force. Uh, this uh, Kenneth Chase in a really good book that's sort of a history of firearms, which starts in Asia because that's where firearms are invented and that's where they diffuse to the rest of the globe from, uh, says that the, Japan's initial success was for these reasons. They swept away, but their, the reasons for their success, the Koreans were poorly organized. Uh, they, uh, they weren't ready for the scale of this attack. Uh, the Japanese were finely honed veteran troops. And think of it like uh, Napoleon's armies as they streamed, streamed into Germany and Italy and these other places. That, they, they were these veteran combat-tested troops, and they were out for booty. Okay? They, they, wanted, they, they wanted glory and they wanted booty. Uh, they, and their use of muskets... Uh, was particularly effective. They were particularly effective. Now what? So they win and win and win. And remember, their goal is to invade China, but winter is coming. <laughs> okay? So, the, so this is where the empire strikes back. For the Ming, Korea is a buffer tributary state. Okay? The buffer part is more important than the tributary part. All right? The buffer part is we need a buffer between us and these dwarf pirates on these islands who every time, you know, we run into them, they do nasty things to our sailors who get shipwrecked in Japan. So, so, so they need a buffer between Japan and China. And then Korea has a long-standing relationship of the Korean royal house as a tributary state of China. So the, the issue today with the Kim family regime and, and Xi Jinping in China, that's a pattern that's existed for 2,000 years, all right? Although I think Kim family regime is probably a little more autocratic than the, than the royal uh, uh, Hangul family that's, that's occupying the throne in Korea at this time. So the Ming dynasty finds out what's happened, and they put together an army to strike back against the Japanese. Um, at the same time as the Japanese press north towards the Yalu River, guerrilla operations begin in their rear by uh, the Koreans. So the Koreans, uh, Korea uh, back then was a mountainous peninsula covered with forests. The forests hadn't all been chopped down by the Japanese yet, uh, which the Japanese will do starting about 1890-ish. Oh, but anyway, uh, 95. So, uh, so, so there's this guerrilla war in the south. Yes, the Japanese hold some of the major cities. Uh, most of the major cities, they hold the capital of Seoul. Uh, they hold Pusan. They, they hold these major areas. Uh, but their lines of communication are being attacked. So as they go north, their army gets smaller and smaller and smaller as they protect their lines of communication in the peninsula. At the same time, a Korean Ming Navy or navies begin to attack the, uh, the Japanese sea lines of communication. So this is a really modern-ish conflict. Uh, you've got guerrilla warfare, you've got warfare, conventional warfare, sieges are still going on for some of the holdout Korean cities, although uh, by the time the main battle occurs at Pyongyang, we're going to see most of those sieges are over. And then you've got active warfare at sea with cannon, with ships with cannon that are fighting each other. And they're attacking the sea lines of communication. So it's very much of a compound kind of warfare with uh, irregular warfare, regular warfare, and naval warfare. So when I talk about this to my students, I say this is multi-domain operations. All right, so the Ming Korean commander is going to be Li Rusong. He's going to put on the golden dragon helm of the Ming. You know, sort of a kind of, okay, this means I'm in command. 
and he's going to bring 50,000 troops and 200 large cannon across the frozen wastes of Manchuria. He's going to tow them on sledges across the ice and the snow, and that's going to be the main piece that he's built this army around. He'll also have some Korean troops that are part of this 50,000. Meanwhile, the Japanese have taken up residence in Pyongyang with their main northern army, and it'll be under So Yushotuna, Yukonaga, and there'll be another guy named Shigenobu who will come later. That, we're not sure how many Japanese are really there. 15,000 to 30,000 troops, high end 30,000, low end 15,000. We're really not sure because uh, you, you, the Japanese chronicles are pretty unclear on this. Uh, and, and, and of course, with the Chinese, they're going to elevate the numbers because, you know, you always want to defeat a big army that outnumbers you, not a smaller army that, that you outnumber, right? Because it doesn't look good in the headlines and the narrative. So that's why the numbers are a little uh, iffy. Although this, this is a pretty reliable number here, at least according to guys like Peter Lorge and Ken Swope. All right, the naval war is under the great patriotic hero of Korea, Admiral Yi Sun-shin. He starts out with a fleet that's inferior to the uh, shogun's fleet. It's what we call a fleet in Bing. So the idea here is to keep the Japanese honest. In other words, to keep their fleet engaged, to threaten them, to force them to protect their lines of communication instead of using their navy to project power further up the peninsula. He's entirely successful in that. Remember that little boat I showed you? He comes up with these very innovative turtle boats that can grapple with, uh, grapple with uh, cannon. They can fight on all sides. Um, and the culmination of his war is this battle at Hansan Island where he destroys a Japanese fleet. What this does is this starts to cut the supplies that are coming from Japan to Korea. Uh, it's wintertime. The harvest has already been brought in. What the peasants and the cur retreating Korean armies haven't destroyed or taken with them. And who's been to Korea? It's a pretty grim, bare place in the wintertime, all right? Um, and so the Japanese are now going to start to have problems feeding their troops, never mind feeding the local populace. Of course, this is the beginning of sort of the Japanese, or more of a confirmation of the sort of regular Japanese approach to warfare, which is the only people who, if there's no food around or little food around, the only people who get fed are the Japanese troops. Nobody else gets fed, and everybody else can just starve to death as far as we are concerned. This is a pretty horrific war, guerrilla warfare, mass famine, atrocities at every turn. There's the turtle boat. See the anchor that they can use to, uh, it can maneuver. It's very maneuverable because of this really interesting setup with the two sort of wings and the rudder and the tiller. Uh, the samurai, who, 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 their main tactic against navies is to board the other guy's vessel, get in close and board. Well, they essentially say, well, good luck with that. They have all these holes here where they can stick arc buses or pikes or, or small hand cannon or weather, whatever. Uh, really survivable combat ship. And I think this is uh, Admiral Lee's uh, flagship with his, with his banner flying from it. All right, so here's the geography. The Japanese have invaded. They come through Pusan. Uh, they conduct a major uh, siege at Chongjin. They, they sort of finish off the Korean army. At, uh, at Seoul, and then they drive north to Pyongyang. They send out a party all the way up to the Yalu, to Weiju, and, uh, and, and ambush a Ming force up there, but it's only kind of a reconnaissance in force, uh, and they come back. But they haven't fought the main Ming army yet. We'll probably come back to this map at some point. Also, I talked about Hansan Island. Hansan Island's right here. Notice here's Pusan, major uh, port where Japanese food is flowing in to feed the armies and, and reinforcements and troops. And, and Lee is using his fleet to threaten that, and that's where he wins that, that big battle at Hansan Island. So the final phase of the first war is, the, is well, let's talk about how they get defeated. I thought I had a slide on that. So the, the, uh, the samurai decide, oh, we've gone too far forward. They retreat back, and they create an armed camp of 15 to 30,000 troops at Pyongyang. Lee Rusong, the, the uh, commander of the Ming, comes down with his 200 cannon, surrounds the town. There's a Japanese army that's trying to march in relief, 
but they've, they've gone too far, too fast, they've become separated, and in a vicious multi-day battle, the Chinese essentially surround Pyongyang, and they have these large cannon compared to the Japanese. The Japanese cannon are small, they're almost like handguns, like the kind of guns you see in the old movies about, you know, the British where they put these little, you know, tiny carronades and stuff on rowboats and fire. The Japanese have those, but they don't have any big cannon. So the Ming have this huge advantage in cannon. They surround it, and they just basically blast the samurai to pieces. The samurai fight very well, but they lose at least a third of their army. And then they begin to retreat. And it's during the retreat where, where uh, the Ming and the Koreans really sort of exact the most damage as the Japanese retreat back into South Korea. This pattern should be familiar. Okay. So what happens is the Ming say, okay, we've shown you that we're the most powerful nation in the region. Uh, let's talk peace. And so they negotiate with the Japanese directly and negotiate a Japanese withdrawal from everywhere except Pusan, all right? Um, the Koreans are not involved in these negotiations. They kind of sit on the sidelines, all right? So the Chinese are going to negotiate with the Americans, excuse me, with the Japanese, and they're going to leave sort of the Koreans, the North Koreans in, in the more modern case, on the sideline and agree to this. So the Japanese do withdraw, and they accept due to one, they've been defeated badly at, at Pyongyang. The guerrilla warfare is just wearing them down because of the Navy problems. They're having problems getting in uh, reinforcements and logistics. And then uh, Yukonaga, who is, uh, who is one of the warlords, he's and they become sort of a peace party saying, hey, you, what are we doing here? Why are we here in Korea fighting these people? You know, our whole goal was to go to China, and we, 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 we barely saw China, and then we had to pull back and get defeated. So the Japanese have this enclave left in Pusan. However, Hideyoshi is still the shogun. Hideyoshi never personally goes to Korea. He lets his warlord generals do this. Very, very intelligent political move by Hideyoshi. You know, these warlords are all ambitious, ruthless, powerful men. Better to have them in Korea kind of, you know, bickering amongst themselves while they're killing Koreans and China, Chinese than scheming against him back at uh, Kamakura uh, and Edo, which is where Hideyoshi has set himself up as the shogun, Edo, Tokyo. So Hideyoshi still wants to invade Korea. Uh, Yi is no longer in command. Uh, uh, of the Korean Navy. He's sort of kind of the, you know how it is, these guys, you use them in war, but then peace comes, and uh, they kind of get edged out of power, and that's kind of what happens to Yi. The Ming mobilize as soon as the second invasion occurs, um, but the Koreans actually do much better even before the Ming have any impact, and the Ming impact isn't going to be with their armies, it's going to be with their naval support as the Koreans begin to use the same thing. Um, so the Koreans start to force the Japanese to conduct all these costly sieges, and Yi resu resumes command and starts to win again. And Yi is the Japanese commander. He starts to win again. A again, he had, he had sort of been edged out, but then he comes back in command when it's like, we need somebody to kind of solve this problem for us. So, you know, Korea's become a quagmire for Japan. They want to leave, but they don't want to leave. They want to leave a little enclave in Kabul, I mean in Pusan, but they don't want to, they don't want to leave completely, you know. Um, they, they want options for the future, freedom of action, right? Um, and then Hideyoshi dies in September of 1598. And that kind of takes all the air out of this. When Hideyoshi dies, what happens in Japan? Power struggle, okay? Hideyoshi's chosen successor, uh, who, is, who is supposed to, who is actually a member of one of the Japanese noble shogun families. So Hideyoshi has sort of become a regent for a puppet shogun. And when Hideyoshi dies, everybody swears allegiance to Hideyoshi's choice to relieve him. But Tokugawa Iyasu is like, yes, yes, I will be loyal. And he almost immediately begins to scheme against this new, untested, 
uh, guy. And again, most of the power is over in Korea. So all the warlords come back, and Japan breaks down into civil war again. Okay, Japan breaks down into civil war again. At the same time, the Koreans help because they fight a battle at Myongyang, and then another naval battle at Noryang Straits. The Noryang Straits is down here. And again, they savage several of these Japanese fleets. Uh, and the Japanese are lucky to be able to have any boats left to pick up whatever's left of their army and evacuate Korea. The Japanese lose ugly. They leave Korea, they rape, pillage, burn, destroy everything on the way out, just as they will do several hundred years later when they pull out of Russia, when they invade Russia to help the white Russians in the Russian Civil War. They'll rape, pillage, loot most of Korea as they pull out, by the way. So kind of some similar Japanese behavior that you kind of tend to see throughout history. And they'll pull back to Japan. Legacy, China, Korea, Japan, an enduring dynamic. If this all seems very familiar to you, it should. It happens again. All right, once the Japanese come out of their sheltered isolation of the Tokugawa regime and the Meiji Emperor begins his westernizing reforms, where's the first place Japan goes? Korea. They go to Korea. They also go to Taiwan, which the Japanese call Formosa. That's the Japanese name for it. But uh, yeah, they go back to Korea, and of course, they fight the Chinese again. But this time they win. All right, so this is an enduring dynamic of China, Korea, and Japan, with Korea often as the battleground between Japan and China as they sort of vie with each other for hegemony in Northeastern Asia. Another reminder that advanced weaponry does not guarantee victory, okay? And this is fascinating because I told you the Ming actually have a technological weapon advantage but the second Korean campaign or the second Korean war in this is not one with Ming cannon. It's one sort of with what the tools that they have at hand. And, uh, and, and, it's, and here's where the army of the people that the Koreans have created over these seven years of horrific warfare does finally wear down and defeat the Japanese. And then this fleet uh, is also a major factor. And the Japanese learned that when you project power overseas, uh, you've got to take care of the Navy piece as well. And uh, perfect segue, that's uh, what we're going to do here uh, in, a, in the next session that Dr. Babb's going to do on 7 December. Um, and uh, I think I've established a pretty good context for you, Jeff, for your, for your thing. I've left plenty of time for questions here, and then I can go back to maps and pictures if you need them. So I will now open it up for questions. We have a, a microphone, so wait till the young lady gets you the microphone. I thoroughly enjoyed your time warp slips. <laughs> a question about the influence of this era on ultimate state formation in Korea. As an independent culture of between China and Japan? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, you saw the turtle boat. This, this is, you know, what Gallipoli is to national identity for the Australians, what Lexington and Concord are to us and our national identity. This is the war the Koreans look to uh, as a part of shaping their national identity. Now, I don't want you to be confused. Korea is one of the oldest, oldest nations in Asia, uh, long running. I mean, the Koreans never go defunct like those Egyptian dynasties, right? They're always there. It's usually three kingdoms. So K Korea starts out as sort of these three kingdoms, you know, one kind of up north, one kind of in the south, and one kind of over in the middle on, on the eastern side. And, but they had the same language, very complicated language, Hangul, uh, but they had this rich, uh, uh, rich culture. Uh, they're called the Hermit Kingdom, um, and they and and uh, and everybody kind of left them alone. The the Chinese, you know, once the the, the Koreans kind of said, "You're our masters." The Chinese were really good at kind of saying, "Okay, send us the tribute if we need ships or sailors or troops. Provide those to us." 
Uh, but that national identity did exist before this war. But this is the war that cements it. Lee, Lee is kind of like George Washington to us. And he's a Korean admiral who defeats the Japanese at all these famous naval battles at Noryang and Hansan Island. So, so it's really huge in the Korean identity, this, this war. You know, we defeated the best samurai army that ever existed. That's, that's what they say, and that's, that's a component of their national identity. Yes. Uh, microphone up here to this, this lady. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I, I'm frankly astonished when you started talking about the size of the armies in Japan. When you look at the geography of Japan and the size of the population, I know that, yeah, the... the the emphasis was to feed the army at all costs, but still, how could they possibly support armies that, of that size with that population? Yeah, it's rather fascinating. And, and the scholars of Japan in this period have really looked at this because they, they've kind of balked. Um, certainly, the numbers aren't, aren't the way they're listed in some of the chronicles. I mean, when we read the chronicles, we're talking about millions, right? And these armies are not that big, all right? The, but they're big, and in and, and Hideyoshi, by, by the time we get to Hideyoshi, now you got to remember, this is 300,000 veteran troops spread throughout Japan, all right? And what do, what do the Japanese eat? They eat fish and rice. They depend on fishermen. The reason these armies are so huge is they're the, the, uh, the franchise for military service breaks down during the war, Warring States period, and because of Gekko Kujo, you have all these portions of the population prior to the Onan War, which is the war that kind of kicks this all off 150 years earlier in the year of Onan, the, uh, who aren't armed. And slowly, as, as order breaks down, the, 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 the franchise of military service and violence spreads. There's this idea called sanctioned state violence. And in Japan, prior to the, to the, to the uh, Sengoku the, the, the state, the sanctioned violence, violence was only sanctioned amongst the samurai, all right? It was not sanctioned in any of the other classes, particularly the peasant farmers and the merchants. And the royalty actually didn't engage in warfare other than as strategists or leaders. The, the samurai had the total franchise on violence, and the, and the samurai were pretty small. That, I mean, we're talking uh, a nation uh, in Japan of, of tens of millions in this period, right? Uh, maybe 10 million, um, and the samurai are a very, very small component of that. But when that, over 150 years, that franchise of violence spreads out and it diffuses, and so everybody becomes armed. Now, when Tokugawa becomes the shogun, he fights this, uh, he fights this epic battle at a place called Sekigahara, Sekigahara. And at Sekigahara, he finally defeats all of the opponents who are revolting against him, that are actually led by, I think, a rebel, either a rebel shogun or a rebel emperor. I always forget which it is. Maybe Tom knows. Is it a rebel, is it a rebel shogun or a rebel emperor that they're, that's leading these guys? But, but those are not the ones in charge. These are all disaffected warlords. The Christians, for example, are uh, the main component of the army that are fighting uh, Tokugawa Iyasu. But when he finally gains control of Japan in 1600, he goes and he collects all the weapons, and he stores them with the daimyo he trusts. And these are called the sword hunts, but they're also arquebusier hunts and cannon hunts. And he disarms the entire nation. Okay? Now, the logistics piece is even more fascinating because Japan has reached this point in modernity, and most Japanese historians consider this to be the beginning of Japanese modernity, not Matthew C. Perry in the black ships, but Tokugawa Iyasu, the state builder, they, they, most modern historians agree that actually Japan is already into what we would consider modernity. Um, and, but they're at a point with their population. Now, they've had these wars that have been kind of getting rid of people. I mean, the deaths that occur in this 150-year period would probably boggle your minds. It's like when we talk about the Taiping Rebellion, you know, 20 million Chinese dead in a period of 20 years. Huh? Who knew about that? You know, the biggest catastrophe in the 19th century is in China, all right? Well, this is a huge catastrophe in Asia, and it's occurring in Japan, although China's got catastrophes to match over on its side with the Ming and the Qing and all that. So 
So, so they've gotten to a point where they're, they're having trouble feeding themselves. And, and the Japanese need to start importing their food. And one source of food is Korea. Uh, Okinawa, uh, there are rice, there's rice, the population is not as heavy, so they do have, so you're looking for places where you have excess wealth, particularly food, um, and that's why the naval battles are so important. The Japanese can't feed themselves in Korea, they just can't, the, it won't support it. If you cut off the Japanese ability to ship in uh, rice, primarily rice, uh, and again, uh, you can only fish the sea so much, you know, and the fishing seasons, they have their, their you know, harvest periods, their periods of, of stuff. So, so the Japanese, uh, this is a real problem, and this will be a problem for the Japanese when they isolate themselves. Their biggest problem the Tokugawa shoguns will have will be feeding the Japanese people. In fact, the, the, uh, the motto is the shoguns will, will, uh, will keep control of the people enough so that they can produce the rice to feed the samurai class, but not enough so that they can be strong enough to revolt against the shoguns, all right? And so for 200 years, that's Japan. From 1600 until 18, you know, the 1860s, uh, Japan is on the edge of starvation for most of that period. The bulk of the population are living on a diet that leads to early death or death via disease, much higher rates of disease. So your question is really good because it helps you kind of understand the demographics of food and geography and, and the political thing. The Japanese sacrificed hugely when they isolate themselves after Sekigahara. Hideyoshi's trying to broaden that out into a more, uh, a more, a more workable Japanese empire that can feed itself, okay, that can feed itself. We had another question, I think Tom, and then we'll take Don. And then we'll go back over here to airline. Yeah, Tom. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation very much. Uh, uh, you described these uh, vast armies being gathered by uh, Hideyoshi, then uh, moved across blue water to Korea, and uh, uh, moved and supplied by ship across blue water. Uh, my question is, uh, after all these troops uh, exfiltrate back to Japan, uh, and uh, Ieyasu, Tokugawa Ieyasu becomes the uh, new uh, shogun, uh, he's family in power for a couple hundred years. What happens to those gigantic blue water fleets? Again, you, it, you don't keep a navy around unless you can do something with it, right? And so having navies are expensive. Uh, they're difficult to maintain. You can do most of your trading and moving of goods in this, port, this area of Asia um, with, smaller, with smaller vessels, actually. So the big vessels are great for power projection of armies, particularly armies that have lots of horses, all right, and have cannons. But again, essentially, the, the most difficult place for navigation on this map is here, the Korea Strait, particularly this part of it and this part of it, right? That's why all the battles take place here, all right? But otherwise, most of it is littoral. So you don't, one, you don't need big blue water ships, you don't need blue water navigation, uh, the Ryukus extend south of here, again, so you can do littoral navigation and you can essentially move ships in smaller galleys and junks, uh, sail-driven junks, and, uh, and that's how they do it. The Japanese will trade after Hideyoshi dies and Tokugawa takes over, but they will, they will only trade to a very, very limited degree and insularly there. But uh, yeah, so they, uh, again, you've, you, they, they don't need a navy anymore. That's the short answer. The short answer is they don't need a big navy anymore because they don't have this big army that they have to support in Korea. So why have a big navy? Why have a navy if you don't need a navy? Navies are expensive. They take a lot of money to build. And once you build them, you're stuck with them, you know, for, for a long, long time. You know, when you build that nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, you're going to have that thing for 50 years. And the maintenance and the upkeep costs on that, on that aircraft carrier uh, could basically build you every year with the maintenance and upkeep costs on the carrier uh, you could build a new destroyer every year with the money that it takes to operationally run a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. So that's 50 destroyers that you could have over a period of 50 years, or one nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Don, I think you're next. So uh, uh, Mike here, and then we'll come back over to Erlen, and then we'll go back over there. Yes, sir. This is connected to your yeah. d uh, demographic and economic thing. 
Uh, you mentioned earlier the military revolution, and you talk about it in a worldwide context. Jeffrey Parker, who, <laughs> who uh, talked about it in a European context, expanded it. But he also expanded it in an economic and demographic context, too, in his global, the global crisis. Could you explain how uh, Parker's uh, thesis of the global crisis reflects this period? Uh, so what does Parker mean by the global crisis? The, the global crisis is due to the little ice age. Oh, okay, okay, all right, okay, all right. Well, you know, y you have the reality of sort of macro trends in, in climate change that are taking place all throughout human history, but what Don is talking about is you get this period where you finally are able to navigate the globe. All right, and this, this, occurs, this occurs in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries is when human beings finally figure out how to get in a ship and go around the globe. And, and to get in a ship and to be able to go to the same point on the other side of the globe with a reasonable probability that you'll get there. All right, Enough probability that if you build three ships, you send, two of them, you send all three of them over, two of them are probably going to come back loaded with spice and silk and stuff. And so you, now you can create holding companies and sort of capitalist, capitalist means and corporations and wealth building by using the resources of the entire globe, uh, portions of which are very sparsely populated or they're, they're, they, they, the resources are waiting to be maybe extracted. Um, and you also have disease playing a factor here. So the global crisis that's taking place has to do with the fact that you've had all this warm weather you get the mini ice age that comes in. You know, this happens to the Romans. You know, where do all those steppe warriors come from? Well, they come from these nice warm steppes where people overpopulate. And then it gets cold and they have to move south, all right? That's kind of a, that's kind of a very simplistic way to think about it. This happens in Asia, too. So it's not just happening in Europe. It's also happening in Asia, all right? Uh, I mean, during this entire period, the Ming are bandling the Jurchen steppe-mounted tribesmen at the same time, who are also encroaching on their borders. So the Ming don't just have a Japanese problem over here, they've got a, they've got a steppe problem over here with nomadic steppe peoples whose uh, pasture lands are, are being encroached on and aren't as productive as they used to be. And people do what people do. They'll go, well, that's more productive, so I'll go north and cross the Rio Grande. That's more productive, so I'll go north and cross the Mediterranean. It's the same dynamic, and it happens in sort of a perfect stormish way in the 16th and the 17th centuries. And so, but it doesn't just apply to Europe. That's Parker's great failure, is he doesn't understand that this actually happens in Asia to, to a, a far more interesting extent because the populations are so much larger, so much larger. Again, most of this technology is coming out of Asia. It's not coming out of Europe. Europeans improve on the technology. But uh, what the Europeans contribute is two things. Really accurate clocks, and, uh, and then they combine that with navigation. So they figure out, they got guys like Johannes Kepler and Taku Brahe keeping track of the stars so they can come up with ways to predict where they are in the globe based on where the stars or the sun is, and then they can predict how far west or east they are based on really accurate clocks where they kind of use an iterative process to figure out where they're at any time of year. And they build these vast almanacs so that if you're at this point in the Atlantic in November with the Julian calendar or the Gregorian calendar, calendars count, right, in this case, then you know that if you take a sun line and the sun is going like this, that it's 1130. And that means you're here because now you know where you are so you can look at your clock and you can compare it with the clock at Greenwich, all right, which you're also keeping on your ship. You've got two clocks on these ships. You've got one that's set to the clock at Greenwich, very, very accurate chronometer. They don't have rubidium standards yet. They're getting there, okay? And then you've got this other clock that you continually reset based on your fixes or your position on the globe. So there's an explosion of mapping and everything. But bottom line is, uh, you know, you're, you're, people are looking for the better life. They're looking for, a, they're looking for an improvement in their quality of life. 
And, and what, what comes out of this is the generation of wealth, which will displace sort of the hand-to-mouth economy approach and replace it with the wealth-building approach that sort of dominates the globe today. Now, this all depends on resources, right? But uh, what the Europeans discover is that you can create wealth on a global basis here, although this doesn't start out as a kind of a wealth creation scheme. It starts out as a, hey, how do we, how do we have a better life scheme? How do we feed ourselves? For the Japanese, how do we feed ourselves? I, I don't know how much scholarship has been done on the fact that, one, Hideyoshi is like, how do I feed these armies? Well, send them to Korea. That's a good way to feed them. And some of them will get killed, so you won't have to feed those guys. All right. So maybe there's some of that going on. I don't know what the scholarship says about that. We had another question from Erlant, and then I think we've got a guy in the back and another guy up here. You guys are getting the secret of navigation. It's a pretty Sir, good deal. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as a student on, from CGSC and a European, my question regards the 30 years of war. So we've been teaching or been taught about the 30 years of war from 1618 to 1648. Now, this happens 20 years prior. Right. So to what extent does the tactics involved in this war, which seems very similar to what we will see in Europe, influence each other or at all? Do Europeans look at this war and copy it in the European theater? Or does this, the technologically or how we fight this war happen in vacuums? Well, first, you know, with the 30 years, with the 30 years war is within this Western context of one, the, the European version of the, mili the global military revolution, and let's call it that, okay? Um, um, and so, so it happens within that context, and it, it has elements that, that don't translate well in terms of parallels with what takes place in Asia. I mean, uh, there's all sorts of wars taking place in Asia. Japan's not the only place that's got, you know, giant armies of armed men roaming around the country, murdering each other, raping, killing, uh, and causing the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that's what this period looks like. I mean, you know, there's usually smoke somewhere on the horizon uh, for 150 years in Japan, all right, as these shogun armies bounce around uh, fighting each other. So in that sense, it does sort of look like the Thirty Years' War, but, but it's almost a pure principle of power here. It's not, the religious element is, is very, very muted for, for these wars. There's, there's not that religious uh, element. But by the end of it, you've, you've got real problems, you know, uh, in the countryside. Uh, again, who's going to bring in the harvest? In Japan, it's fascinating. It's the women who bring in the harvest, all right? So the women will sort of become the breadwinners here, or the bread, the bread makers and the bread growers. All right. Um, uh, now, uh, looking at the looking at the, it from another context, um, uh, this what happens in Asia stays in Asia. It's like Vegas, right? Okay. So 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 this is really opaque. Maybe the Europeans know about what's going on with the Ming. But again, the Europeans, they know there's these fabulous riches in the East, but the West doesn't really begin to penetrate Asia until later, until the late, 16th, or the late 17th century and then the 18th. You don't even get the McCart McCartney mission, you know, named after Paul McCartney's great-great-grandfather. You don't even get the McCartney mission to, to the Qianlong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty until the end of the 18th century. The war, the war in Korea and the Sengoku in Japan, only like a couple Dutch and Portuguese kind of know about it. It's entirely opaque. Okay, who was next? Uh, was it you, sir, in the back? Okay, we got another one. This gentleman in the red hat. I hope I answered your question. Did I answer it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hideyoshi, um, under the uh, mentorship of uh, Nob Nobunaga, yep. he's Ashigaru, and he yep. raises up through there. So he's experienced uh, the m massive uh, peasant armies with the samurai. Mm -hmm. When he gets into power, uh, I think it was in 58, he has his sword hunting. Yeah. He seems to go against his uh, upbringing, and uh, 
he stratifies society also in 92. Does this change the complex of the armies that go in, or are they pretty well, well the same? Well, yeah, so there's, so, you know, history's interesting, because it's, it, history is, is not just sort of these neat little milestones that occur. It's really, it's a process piece, right? Here, right? And Hideyoshi realizes one of the problems in Japan is there's too many armed people, all right? I mean, here, here's this guy, you know, Tokugawa, who's got this big army, right? And initially, Hideyoshi and Tokugawa fight. They actually fight a battle with each other, and it's sort of a stalemate. And then Hideyoshi goes, well, why don't you just join me instead? And Tokugawa goes, okay, what are you going to give me? And, and Hideyoshi says, I want you to, you know, subdue the Hojo, you know, or something like that. So, so anyway, in the Kanto plane. So, so, um, so this is a process, right? So, so is Tokugawa the first one to try to disarm the population? No, no. I mean, people have tried and failed, right? Uh, but they do realize that they've got a huge problem. But one way to solve this problem is to take the armies out of Japan. Um, and I firmly believe, although I haven't seen the scholars talk much about it, may maybe, maybe there's some histories in Korean that haven't been translated into English or something, because I don't speak Korean or write Korean or read Korean for that matter, um, I'm Sanida, but anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, that, the talk more about, uh, the motivations for Hideyoshi here, but it seems to make sense that, that there is a crisis looming in Japan with these giant armed armies. It seems like every time the leader dies, whether it's Odu Nobunaga, whether it's Hideyoshi, or later on, uh, when it's, you know, you know, we're going to go through a crisis when, when Tokugawa dies, right? Um, and, and you'll have the genocide in Kyushu, the, the, the Christian genocide in, in Kyushu that kind of takes place as that's happening. But it's kind of a process. So, uh, you know, I've found the guys who tend to be more effective in kind of finishing off things that, uh, that become sort of major elements of the narrative are often not the originators of the idea itself, right? So, it, and this is true in Chinese history too. The Chinese, the Chinese always say, it's not the first emperor that counts, it's the second emperor. He's the consolidator. He's the institution builder. And so, yeah, there might, uh, Nobunaga might have had a good idea, but yeah, we're, we're at war, we can't do that yet. Hideyoshi gets a period of peace, he might start to think about it, but then here's this easier solution of kind of sending the army over to Korea, right? And then, you know, we can worry about disarming everybody. And it'll be a lot easier to disarm Japan if we've only got 150,000 armed retainers inside Japan instead of 300,000, something like that. But I can see that Tokugawa is the guy that kind of says, okay, this is a really good idea, and now we can do it. Now we can start to disarm everybody. Uh, but we, uh, the, you know, what, what happens in Japan after Tokugawa takes control is, it's fascinating. Tokugawa is not celebrated that much. They, you know, it's the 99 ninja or whoever. The, you know, the Japanese love the failures more than they love the winners. It's a, there's a really great book on that called The Nobility of Failure uh, that talks about that. Yeah. Did, did I kind of help you understand that? I think it was probably a process. Uh, you know, oh, that guy had a good idea, but we can't implement it now. Uh, let's implement it now. Let's really hunt down all the swords, all the arquebuses, all the cannons, all the pikes, burn the pikes, store the swords if they're well made, melt them down if they're not, turn them into plowshares. And for 250 years, Japan is at peace. Yes, sir. Okay. That was our last question. Thank you so much. You guys really stressed me out. Thank you. Oh, no, that's okay. But I'm glad you explained it to me, though. Makes sense. Food shortages then cause a consolidation.